Um, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to, uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Chris Gandaya. Chris is the founder director of Home for Good. Um, he's well known to many Christians in the UK as an inspirational speaker, a great motivator. And I'm really looking forward to what you have to share with us. Uh, welcome and thank, thank you for being part of our 24 Hours with Spurgeon. I'll disappear and hand it over to you. <laughs> thank you, Philip. Uh, hello, everybody. It's a privilege to be here. And um, I've been a great fan of Spurgeon for a long time. Uh, I think there are three C's that help me to appreciate him. The first is his clarity. He's the master of the brilliant little uh, illustration, way of crystallizing the way that uh, a biblical idea comes forward. Uh, I think the second thing uh, I love about him is his canonicity, that uh, he uses the whole of the Bible so well. He brings it to life. And uh, even in this little sermon that I'm going to read to you in a minute, uh, you'll hear so many different references to what the Bible has to say uh, from all over the scriptures. And thirdly, I think what I appreciate about him is his Christocentrism. He loves Jesus and he helps make Jesus really clear uh, for all of us. Uh, brilliant. So I'm going to read to you from the sermon called The Heirs of God, which was given in the Metropolitan Tabernacle. And uh, it's all about adoption. And that's something I'm very passionate about. So I hope you enjoy it. And I'll make some comments at the end. Uh, Philip, we are both on the screen together. I don't know if you want to be. It's very nice to see you. Uh, but there you go. Uh, great. All right. Here is the text. It's Romans chapter eight, verse 17. And it is, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. The first thing that I see in this text is the ground of heirship. If children, then heirs. The children of God are heirs of God and they come to be heirs through being his children and in no other way. Mark that we are not heirs of God as the result of creation. My beloved friend, Nature will never entitle you to be a joint heir with Christ. Whatever you may think of your human nature, and you may suppose that it is not so depraved as the nature of others, you may even get the notion that yours is a very superior sort of human nature. Well, let it be what it may. It will not entitle you to this inheritance. For as it was not the children of flesh who were necessarily the heirs of the old covenant, even as Ishmael, born after the flesh, was not the heir, but Isaac, born after the spirit, and not Esau, but Jacob, so it is now. It is not what you are by nature, not that which is born of flesh, but what you are by grace, that which is born of the spirit. That is the ground upon which heirship may be claimed before God. So, my dear hearer, if you are in a state of nature, if you have never passed out of that state into a state of grace, this text has nothing to do with you. And further, as our heirship with God depends upon our being the children of God, it does not depend upon our natural descent. I've already shown you that it does not depend upon our nature, but there is another phase, that truth, which needs to be mentioned. There were some of old who said, we have Abraham as our father. But being born as sons of Abraham after the flesh availed not to give them any part of the inheritance which was according to the spirit. And today there are some who say we are the children of godly parents. We were born in a Christian land. So, of course, we are Christians. And once more, the main evidence of our being children of God by the new birth lies in our believing in the Lord Jesus Christ as many has received him to them he gave power to become the sons of God even to them that believe on his name which were born not of blood nor of the will of the flesh nor of the will of man but born of God there are many evidences of the life of God in the soul but there is no other that is so abiding as the possession of faith in Jesus Christ perhaps dear friends you are afraid to say that you have the likeness of God upon you although others can see it. But I hope you are not afraid to say, I do believe that Jesus is the Christ. And the Apostle John says, whoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. If you accept him as appointed and anointed of God to be your saviour and commit your soul into his hands, then be sure that you are a child of God. For true, simple, sincere faith in the Lord Jesus Christ exists 
only in the heart of the regenerate. No unregenerate man ever did or ever could believe in Jesus Christ. But where the Lord has been given the divine life, he gives faith at the same time. Faith, which is the surest proof of the existence of that divine life of the soul. Now, I, I love this next bit. I, listen closely because Spurgeon just crystallizes some really important things for us. God, grant to each one of you the grace to test yourself by these four questions. One, have I been born again? Two, have I the spirit of adoption? Three, have I at least some likeness to my heavenly father? Four, do I believe in Jesus Christ? If so, then you are a child of God. And that childhood is the ground of heirship. So we can leave that point and go on to the next. The text teaches the universality of heirship to all the children of God. If children, then heirs. Not some of them heirs, but if children, then heirs. All of them, without exception, proven that they are children. It is also proven that they are heirs. It is not some among men, for often it is only the firstborn sons who are the heirs. But with God, the rule is, if children, whenever born, then heirs. Notice again that all God's children are his heirs because they are all equally related to him through whom the heirship comes. For every child of God is neither more nor less than brother to the Lord Jesus himself, yea, a member of his body, of his flesh and of his bones. In this brotherhood which Christ, there can be no degrees, sorry, in this brotherhood with Christ, there can be no degrees. A man is not partly a brother and partly not a brother. If he is a brother of Christ, he is his brother. A woman is not partly in Christ and partly out of Christ. If one with Christ, they are one with Christ. And all the members of Christ's mystical body are quickened by the same life and shall have the same heaven to dwell in forever. Seeing then that we are all one in Christ Jesus, the heirship which comes to us by way of the firstborn must come equally to all children. Beautiful, beautiful. My last point is perhaps as blessed as any in the whole text. It is the partnership of the claimants to the inheritance, joint heirs with Christ. This is, first of all, the test of our heirship. Listen, you are not an heir of God alone. You cannot be. You can only be an heir of God through being in company, joint heir with Christ. Now, are you and Christ in company? That is a simple question. Are you and Christ in company or do you stand alone? If you stand alone, you are a poor, miserable, bankrupted, gazetted in the court of heaven. And do not try to stand alone. You will perish if you do. But are Christ and you thus joined together? Have you learned to trust in Christ, to live in Christ, to pray in Christ, to trade with heaven through Christ? And to have everything in Christ, that is the test of heirship. God's child, God's child is born God's heir, but it is because he is in Christ and is born in union with Christ that he becomes God's heir. If we are out of Christ, we are out of the family of God and out of the heirship of God. Without Christ, you are without God in the world. But in Christ, joined in company with Christ, you are an heir of God. This also shows the greatness of the inheritance, because if we are to be joint heirs with Christ, it cannot be a little thing that we are to share with him. Can you imagine what the father would give to his son as the reward of the travail of his soul? Give yourself time to think what the everlasting God would give to his equal son who took upon himself the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men and who humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even death on the cross. Can you think of a reward that would be large enough for him? Let the father's love and the father's justice judge. Oh, it must be a large inheritance for such a well-beloved son and such an obedient son as he was. Again, this joint heirship ensures the inheritance to us. I'm quite sure that I should not like to go into partnership with just anybody whom I might meet in the street. Indeed, 
if I had a share in any limited liability company, I would do it with as the man did with the bad banknotes. Lay it down and run away from it as fast as I ever could. What multitudes of people have been ruined by taking shares in companies which seem, seem to be the nicest, neatest, most money-getting schemes under heaven. But one need not mind going shares if one has nothing at all. And the other partner is the wealthiest in the whole world. So what a blessing it is to go shares with Christ because we know that he cannot fail. I was thinking just now, that if I ever should lose heaven, seeing that I am joint heirs with Christ, it would be the firm that would lose it because we must stand or fall together if we are joint heirs. Somebody once said to a holy man, your soul will be lost. Then he said, Christ will be the loser. If our souls are lost, it will be Christ who will be the loser, for he bought us with his blood and he will lose what he purchased at so great a cost. And his father gave us to him. So we will lose his father's gift and he has loved us and is married to us. So he will lose his spouse, the beloved of his soul. But he will not lose us. He cannot lose us. And if Christ cannot lose his inheritance, then none of his people can lose theirs for we are joint heirs with him. If two partners go into a court of law and the case is decided against one, it is also, it is against the other also, for the two are one in the matter. So if the decision could by any possibility be given against anyone who is in Jesus Christ, it would be given equally against the Lord Jesus Christ himself. But that cannot be. How secure then is the inheritance of the saints we are joint heirs with Christ. I thus set before you the heirship of the saints and the way to attain it. I pray God, the Holy Spirit, to apply the message of his people uh, to his own people and to make them feel glad in the Lord. As for the others, I've shown that they can only be heirs through being children. And if you are not the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus, I pray the Lord to reveal to you whose children you must be. And what inheritance you must expect to have at the last. Yet, I pray you to remember that the way of salvation lies in simply looking to Jesus Christ. May you look to him tonight, not tomorrow, ere you leave this place. Present this, paper, present this prayer. O oh Lord, give me the nature of thy children and the spirit of thy children and faith in Jesus as all thy children have it for his own dear name's sake. Amen. Amen. What an amazing sermon C.H. Spurgeon preaches here. I love it. Do you see the clarity? He, he hammers home his big idea that through being adopted into God's family, we are co-heirs with Christ. And don't you love the way that he just helps you to realise how secure that is? Because if God makes us co-heirs. We're like in a, a joined up company with Jesus and Jesus won't let the company fail. And it would be as, as crazy as Jesus going bankrupt for him to lose a hold of us. Beautiful, beautiful clarity. And, and did you see how canonical it was? He keeps drawing in different parts of the Bible. Often he doesn't reference it. He's, he's referencing Romans 8. That's his text. But he goes to John's gospel uh, and talks about uh, how um, to all who believed in him, he gave the right to become sons of God, children born, not of natural descent or husband's will, but born of God. He just keeps riffing on these beautiful ideas, drawing in the whole of scripture. And thirdly, he, he draws you to Jesus. He's Christological. Jesus is the center of his sermon. And man, that is something I want in my preaching. I want to be as clear and as canonical and as Christ-centric as Charles Spurgeon. It's been such an honor uh, to spend time thinking about this sermon and to, to preach it on Spurgeon's behalf. I've been trying to uh, model myself on him for a while. I've been growing a beard and I think my haircut might begin to resemble his too. But this theme, um, and I'm really grateful to Spurgeon's College uh, for letting me preach uh, or read out Spurgeon's uh, sermon on adoption here, because it was a common theme in Spurgeon's preaching. Uh, he often talks about our great privilege of adoption. And it's a strange thing that we don't often preach about that in our churches. It's been a kind of a lacuna, a gap, a blind spot for much of our preaching. And it's something I'm very passionate about. And I realise that 
as a preacher, I've been trying to preach through the scriptures ever since I started preaching in my teens. And yet I missed how privileged we are to be the adopted children of God. I did in my first uh, role as a pastor in a church, uh, I preached through the book of Romans. That's something that uh, new pastors, particularly from conservative evangelical backgrounds, used to think was our rite of passage. I think that might owe a little bit to Spurgeon, but a lot to Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, because preaching Romans was a rite of passage for him. And uh, I managed to preach through the whole book of Romans without making the kind of connections that Spurgeon made here with the privilege of adoption. And it was only later for me when I became an adopted dad that I realised just how privileged we are to be uh, adopted into God's family. Uh, my wife and I had three birth children in three years, and uh, we thought we'd contributed to kind of world population growth. We'd been above the 2.2 children replacement level. And uh, I thought that was it. You know, these children they wonderfully had come into our family. And I was looking forward to the day uh, a little bit optimistically that one day they might all move on into work or university or get married or whatever they were going to do and it would just be my wife and I again and a few things happened to me to make me consider adoption because it really wasn't on my radar. Um, basically uh, some friends of ours in their 60s became foster carers uh, for uh, teenage children and I was really challenged by what they were doing in their 60s and I thought you know what I might consider doing something like that in my 30s. Um, Similarly, I became aware of the need across the nation. In the UK, there were around 5,000 children waiting to be adopted and a shortfall of about 9,000 foster families. And then, miraculously almost, scales were falling from my eyes. As I read the Bible, time after time, God's concern for vulnerable children kept jumping out at me and forcing me to consider what family should look like. God is the most incredible father, as we've been hearing in Spurgeon's sermon, that he wants to welcome us and make us his children, co-heirs with Jesus. What an incredible privilege. But God is often described as a father to the fatherless and a protector of widows and orphans. And so if I'm not passionate about caring for vulnerable children like God is, then there's something wrong with me. And so we started the journey to become foster parents and adopted. And that opened my eyes further to this wonderful doctrine of adoption. I've written about it in a number of books and articles. And the things that strike me have really challenged my approach uh, to family, thinking about God's adopting love. I think, firstly, in many uh, people's minds, adoption is just the third worst way to have a child. People think, you know, there's natural birth. And if that doesn't work for some people, they consider IVF. And if that doesn't work, well, there's always adoption. But that's not how God sees adoption. God didn't adopt us because he wasn't able to have his own birth children. Jesus is the best son any father could ever dream of. And so God had all that he needed in Jesus. God didn't adopt us because he needed it. God adopted us because we needed it. And therefore, it was his incredible compassion and love that drove him to to send Jesus into the world, to let him die for our sins so that we might not just be forgiven and rescued and redeemed, but we could be adopted and made co-heirs with Jesus. And that made me think, wow, what would happen if the church across the UK and across the world could step forward on behalf of all the vulnerable ch children that need a loving family? Children through neglect or abuse are not able to live with their birth families anymore and they need a new family. Imagine if people who hadn't had their own kids or who were single, who had kids and their kids had left home or uh, all sorts of Christians could step forward and say, you know what, because God has loved me with his adopting compassionate grace, I could show that same love to vulnerable children in my nation. And that's what we've seen at Home for Good, the charity that I founded. We've seen so many people step forward. It's been like a prophetic sign, a lived out parable of the incredible adopting grace of God. And so what a wonderful way, what an amazing opportunity, an application, if you like, for this rich doctrine that Spurgeon has been focusing on in this sermon, for us to think about stepping forward to care for vulnerable children right now. Right around the world, there are vulnerable children who need 
the love and support of secure, loving families. And many of those kids uh, would, would love it if they could be reunited under appropriate circumstances with their birth families. But many of those kids, that's not going to be possible. Uh, in the US, there are over 100,000 children in the foster care system that are waiting to be adopted. What an incredible sign of the kingdom of God it would be if the church stepped up and offered a loving home through families in our churches to these children. It would, it would signal something. It would demonstrate in a very tangible way the grace of God to a watching world. I don't know if you've noticed, but many people around the world, because of the coronavirus and the lockdown, are more spiritually open. But many people are also sceptical of a form of faith that is just about words. As I see in the life of Jesus, it wasn't just about brilliant teaching and amazing communication. Jesus lived the gospel that he was proclaiming to the world. He embodied it. He incarnated it. And so the same opportunities here for us as the people of God to demonstrate the truth of the gospel. Yes, with our preaching and, and Spurgeon is a great exemplar, but also with our lives and our actions. And what a wonderful way to do that by taking children who need loving homes into our families, loving them in the same way that God has loved us. He withheld nothing, but was delighted to lavish his love upon us that we could be the children of God. And so that's why my charity exists. And if you want to find more about the charity, then uh, just find me on Twitter, or I also have a little QR code or a web code uh, that you can find out about homeforgood.org.uk slash Krish. And uh, we'd love to tell you more, love to talk to you more about the doctrine of adoption and the beauty and splendor of what it means to be adopted into God's family and then to pass that same love on to children that need it. As I said, I've been a big fan of Spurgeon for as long as I can remember, and I'm a fan of Spurgeon's College too. And it's been a real privilege to be part of their uh, 24 Hours with Spurgeon campaign. I hope you're able to financially support the college. Theological education around the world has a big uh, kind of economic deficit right now. And it's important that we help to raise up the next generation of leader and preacher and teacher uh, from right across uh, the UK and the world, um, there are needs for great theological education, and I do hope you'll be able to get behind Spurgeon's College's campaign. Now, it's odd, isn't it? Because I'm, I'm normally used to doing this interactively, and a Zoom call like this has to be a little bit one way. Uh, but I would love to answer questions if you have them about adoption and the theology of adoption. And feel free to reach out to me and let me know uh, how I can be of use to you. Ah, but here he is. He's back. Nice oh, to see you, Philip. Uh, it's good to see you, uh, Chris, and uh, perhaps it's an opportunity to maybe have that engagement, um, because I think that I think, think you're talking about a, a subject that's purely biblical. It's core to the biblical narrative. Um, do you have a sense of why the subject of adoption perhaps is not preached on as well as much as it used to be? Now, like you, this might make you smile. Um, of course, coming from a reform background, as I do, um, the doc was kind of required reading <laughs> <He was. laughs> and expository preaching. I never quite managed uh, preaching for an hour on the word but, um, <laughs> but uh, I was tempted at, at times. To yeah. try. Do you have a sense of why um, yeah, the subject I... of adoption isn't as widely talked about? I have thought about this a while, and, and there is a resurgence at the moment in a lot of our new hymns and worship songs. We're, we're rediscovering it. So groups like Hillsong and, and Bethel and some of the other kind of emerging uh, worship groups are reintroducing this language, but not necessarily in our preaching. Um, I, I wrote a book called The Greatest Secret. It was all about adoption. And uh, Tim Chester mentioned uh, to me that he said about 80% of his pastoral work is helping people uncover what it means to be adopted into God's family. He thought that would be a foundation. I think one of the reasons we, we might have been embarrassed in the past is adoption was often very secret. Um, it was often covering shame. That was the way it was perceived. But if you couldn't have your own children, if you were infertile, you didn't want anyone to know about that. And therefore you would secretly adopt a child and sometimes pretend that it was your birth child. Um, now, hopefully we've moved on from that. And one of my big ambitions is to sever the link between fertility and adoption. You know, that's what we're trying to do in the Bible passage, isn't it? God was not infertile. That is not why he adopted us. He adopted us out of compassion because it was best for us. 
And so if we can sever that link, say, look, adoption is a gift that you give a vulnerable child out of grace and compassion. I think that might make it easier for us to talk about it in general. I think the other reason I thought of was it might be passive, that we like people to make decisions for Jesus. Well, being adopted is all in God's hands, isn't it? God's got to take the initiative. And that might be to do with kind of reformed uh, approaches to predestination and free will and all that kind of thing. Do you think it also has to do perhaps with, um, and I'm straying into contentious issues here. Um, sure. Do you think it has to do with um, an approach to preaching? That when you take expository preaching, you can't, one, of the, one of the benefits of expository preaching, of course, is you can't ignore the difficult passage. Yeah. Well, do you think that has anything to do with it? I think it could do. I mean, I'm a huge fan of systematic chronological expository preaching and you know, a preaching through a passage but i know from my own experience that i preached through romans and i still missed it so sometimes i think the issue is we get locked in to a little ghetto you know our little tribe and if our tribe doesn't talk about adoption even if i'm looking at the text i still don't see it so that's one of the joys of being part of a wider church community and reading widely and hmm. being international sometimes our international friends can really challenge us with our blinkers and our blind spots so I think if we had a combination of more chronological ex ex expositional preaching and a wider kind of hermeneutical circle of people that would challenge us when we're blinkered, I think that could be the combination. See, I think, it, I mean, I did, I, I must confess, I smiled as glad I wasn't um, recording on, on live on camera when you said you were cultivating Spurgeon's look with the beard. <laughs> I'm working um, on it. I think actually another perhaps you share another element and that's that entrepreneurial approach to, to doing God's work. Where where do you see the next stage in um, your uh, charity that you've set up, Hope for Good? Oh, thanks for asking. So partly because of COVID, things are really complicated right now for children in care. So lots of people that are foster carers are older and they're more vulnerable. And so that's caused a challenge. And because of lockdown, many children who we know that lockdown's causing more domestic violence, more women to join women's refuges, but we're not seeing children come into care because they're not being seen by their teachers or professionals. So we really want prayer and support and volunteers, I guess, to think about stepping forward because sadly we're expecting a tidal wave of children to come into care once lockdown is lifted and they're more visible to the uh, authorities. So there's some very senior um, Christian leaders from the UK and around the world will will participate in this, and I hope many thousands will uh, join in via our website. What would your message be to those Christian leaders on this subject? What, if you if you had the wow. opportunity to to say, uh, give me a minute, this is what I want to say. What, wow. would, what, what would you say to them? I know so, I put you on the spot, but okay, you, you, so you said you like that interaction, so that's what I'm going for. Good, go for it, Philip. So I, I'd say one verse has really challenged me. It's James 1, 27. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and blameless is to care for widows and orphans in their distress. If God were doing a, a, a kind of an evaluation or an Ofsted, if you're in the UK, test on what our worship needs to include as churches, he is looking for care for the vulnerable. And if it's mm -hmm. not there, then we have failed his test of what religion is all about. So I would say that's probably the key idea. I mean, it's the same with the parable of the sheep and the goats. Jesus is looking for faith that isn't just about words. He's looking for us to demonstrate his mercy and compassion to those that need it. That's a, that's a repeated theme in the Bible. We've got to prioritize this and not just make it for a fringe or a certain group or Christians that are wired that way. All of us want to offer God the kind of religion that he asked for in the first place. I can imagine that if Spurgeon was actually um, the unseen guest, he would be going, amen. Absolutely. Amen. I hope so. Our faith has to be real. Um, thank you so much for joining with us. We have had the privilege of having Dr. Chris Gandaya with us. And um, thank you for your support. And I wish you every strength and blessing Brilliant. as we hand over to the, to the next. Uh, Excellent. All the best for the next 18 hours. <laughs> <laughs>